Time for another classic different voice take in the recap compared to the episode. Here's the take from the original episode, where Aang actually sounds emotional. I missed you, buddy. And here's the one from the recap, where he sounds considerably more bored. I missed you, buddy. In this shot from the previous episode, there's no islands present in Lake Laogai, unless they're off over here. But this little island the gang takes a minute to regroup on at the start of this episode seems pretty much dead center of the lake to me. I miss you more than you'll ever know, buddy. <laughs> this shot bears a pretty close resemblance to the shot where Aang says they'll always be together, which is nice since they're just now reuniting. We escaped from the Dai Li, we got Appa back, I'm telling you, we should go to the Earth King now and tell him our plan. We're on a roll. I like that this roll that Sokka says they're on doesn't include the fact that Jet was just fucking murdered. I'm with sweetness. I've seen enough of bossing say. And I can't even see! What time of day is this? Can we please buy a new saddle? Riding bareback is terrifying! Yeah, that's good continuity. You'd think that the sandbenders were the ones that took Oppa's saddle? But no, he still had it attached to him when the sandbenders sold him off. So it's either the beetle-headed merchant guys, or the Fire Nation Circus has it. You know what's fucking sick about this entire action scene? Pretty much everything. Seriously, this is one of the best action scenes the show has to offer, full stop. Everyone gets some cool ass moments, minus Sokka, I guess. But like, Toph with the sideway blocks, Katara with this big sweet move, and gets this, Toph again with the staircase, and it's all animated so beautifully, dude. And it's got that awesome mix of lighthearted avatar comedy in there as well, with the gang apologizing as they completely dominate the Dai Li as they run up. Seriously, a standout scene in the entire show. Incredible. And now, of course, it's time to nitpick the shit out of it. Aang's staff looks really short in the shot before elongating as he stands back up. Wait, how much water can Katara fit in her pouch? We've got some more classic badger mole statues that get thrown at the gang here. And oh look, it's another Sokka's boomerang is brown moment. Haven't seen one of those in a while. So in slow motion, I guess this earth igloo shield makes sense, but am I the only one that in normal speed it always looks kind of weird? Like it just kind of morphs around them unnaturally? Only one of the badger mole statues hit the shield as they bring it up, but there were definitely two that were thrown. The other one just seemingly never lands though, anywhere. I hate to say it, Aang, but the guards that just got thrown under the water definitely didn't pop their heads back out yet, and you just froze the water over top of them. That's another few at least probably confirmed deaths from the hands of Aang. Toph enters the same stance here as she does when she uses her big smokescreen move, and it's even accompanied by the same music cue. Wait, hold on, Sokka has his club back in a few shots here. He definitely shouldn't have it since the sandbenders tossed it in the desert. This is totally a continuity error. Toph, which way did the Earth King? How should I know? I'm still voting we leave Ba Sing Se. By God, she's done it! The Waste High Wave Earth Variation! Someone stop her, she'll kill us all! Well, hello? This is one of the weirdest ones I've found. We can see Zuko sheathed for his swords twice in this shot. On the ground, right here, and also him dragging it along with him. We know that this one is also the sheath because in the next shot, it falls exactly into that position. That's a very weird one. Now that's an impressive door. It's gotta go somewhere. This scene is blocked really strangely. We rejoin the gang and their backs are to this giant wall of rubble. So you would think that they just came from that way or just climbed over it. But Sokka turns away from the camera and sees that that's the direction the Earth King's chamber is in. So why was the entire group facing away from the direction they should have been going in? Did they walk down this hallway, not look over this barrier, and then turn around and look back the way they came all as a group? I always thought this shot was just Aang doing an air blast to fling this door open, but apparently Toph had some hand in it too. Hey, where'd that giant wall of debris go, and Oppa. You invade my palace, lay waste to all my guards, break down my fancy door, and you expect me to trust you? He has a good point. Wait, fuck. More badger mole imagery, this time behind the Earth King's throne, kind of like the dragon imagery behind the Fire Nation throne. If you're on my side, then drop your weapons and stand down. Oh, and there goes the staff. To be fair though, he held onto it that entire time they were storming the castle, so that's pretty impressive for Aang. Also, holy shit, who animated Katara's water here? Why is it so slick? You're the Avatar? Uh, no, him. Over here. This is funny, but I also like that Aang's smart enough to realize that he has to play ball here and he can't just kick some more ass. <laughs> though Bosco seems to like him. I'll hear what he has to say. Bosco may have just kept the gang out of prison for the rest of their lives. As far as things that bears have done, that's pretty high up on the clutch scale, I would say. Long Feng didn't want us to tell you, so he stole our Sky Bison to blackmail us. 
And blackmail is the least of his crimes. He brainwashed our friend. And probably, I mean, I, I think he's dead too. Right there! Up a bit him! I suppose there's no way to prove where those marks came from. Of course there is. <laughs> Yep, that, that pretty, pretty much proves it. Wait, stop that! Though, I suppose this matter is worth looking into. Uh, okay, we'll take it. Okay. That's funny and all, but also, why is Toph taller than Aang in this one shot? That's not right. It's gone! How could they have figured that out? Could it be that the Dai Li knew you were coming and had ample time to destroy the evidence? The wall! They'll never be able to cover that up in time. Oh, yeah! Why is the Earth King the last one going up the hill, with no Dai Li behind him or even near him? This is some pretty awful security work, guys. I don't have any more time for this nonsense. If you come with us, this time you can ride on Appa. Okay, I'm no dream doctor here, and I've been dreading doing this because it's a dream, so it's naturally open to interpretation, but I'll give it my best go. So we've got the two dragons, voiced by Azula and Iroh respectively. They talk to an idealized, unscared version of Zuko as he sits on the throne as Fire Lord. Azula's dragon urges Zuko to fall asleep, or to me, meaning to stay on the throne, or on the path that his father has chosen for him. The Iroh dragon tells him to leave immediately, which, if you're following my line of thinking, is to leave the path that his father has put him on, that Zuko would naturally think would eventually lead him to sitting on this very throne. The world falls out from under him, symbolizing the fact that this path will not lead to all that he wants. And then Azula's dragon says, sleep, just like mother. Ursa's fate is still unknown to Zuko at this point, but I still think this represents the feelings that Zuko feels that the royal hierarchy had taken his mother from him, and then has taken his very home from him as well, as his sister's voice confirms that he's just like his mother, gone, not part of the family. Which is exactly what Zuko is struggling with at this point. What is he if he doesn't listen to his father's mission and isn't part of that family? anymore. Is he still Zuko? He obviously can't be this idealized version of himself as the Fire Lord anymore. The final shot is the throne literally consuming Zuko, which to me either means one of two things. Either the throne is metaphorically representing his father's will, which has consumed him over the past three years, and will continue to consume him if he stays on this path, or it's Zuko imagining himself as a ruthless Fire Lord, losing who he actually is, a gentle, kind soul, to a nationalistic identity of a powerful, exact leader that the throne has represented for the last hundred years. So in summary, I think this dream was largely about Zuko's struggle for his own identity, which is nothing new to Zuko. And that's why when he comes out of it, he's changed so drastically, having decided to side with Iroh's dragon. Of course, it's a dream, so it's 100% open to interpretation. So if you've got a different take on the sequence, leave it down in the comments and I'd love to read it. Perhaps you could explain why there's a Fire Nation insignia on your construction project. Well, it's imported, of course. You know you can't trust domestic machinery. I mean, he's right. The Fire Nation does have way better machinery than anyone else. Dai Li, arrest Long Feng. I want him to stand trial for crimes against the Earth Kingdom. Cool that the Dai Li have these secondary handcuffs made out of metal for Earthbenders to prevent this exact thing from happening from earlier. Looks like Long Feng is long gone. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been waiting to use that one. <laughs> That's the day we need to invade the Fire Nation. The Day of Black Sun. This is the first time the Day of Black Sun is coined, and I don't know if Sokka read it in the library somewhere, or if he just came up with it, but either way, it sounds pretty sick. There are secret files on everyone in Ba Sing Se, including you kids. You think Zuko's file reads? Definitely a firebender. Mike saw him light like 20 candles around a fountain to impress some girl. Toph Bei Fong. Toph instantly hands the scroll to Katara to read. <laughs> Her eyes don't work. It's a letter from your mom. Your mom's here in the city, and she wants to see you. Speaking of which, how would your mom know where to send the letters? How would these two clowns even know where to send the letters? A small fleet of water tribe ships? What? That could be Dad! Protecting the mouth of Chameleon Bay? Led by Hakoda? It is Dad! Just like the Day of Black Sun, this is the first time Hakoda is ever name dropped, which is strange considering we've seen him in a flashback and everything. What you did beneath that lake, it was in such conflict with your image of yourself that you are now at war within your own mind and body. I could believe that. I figure that can happen in real life as well. I'm sure that everyone has made a decision that has at least made them feel sick to their stomach, so betraying your entire life's goal for the past three years could probably send you for a loop pretty hard. So I know some people don't think this works, but I think it does. There's a man living at the Eastern Air Temple. He says he's a guru. What's a guru? 
Some kind of poisonous blowfish? This is a really, really weird reference to the Fugu, which is an actual poisonous blowfish in real life. This is all such big news. Where do we even start? Well, I mean, if you weren't all about to split up, I'd say that Aang unlocking God Mode would probably be at the top of list of importance. Appa and I could drop you off at Chameleon Bay to see your dad. Someone has to stay here with the Earth King and help him plan for the invasion. Do they, though? I know how badly you want to help Dad. You go to Chameleon Bay. I'll stay here with the King. You are the nicest sister ever! That's a nice moment. Similar to Aang and Sokka being homies, it's nice when Sokka and Katara make a real effort to look out for each other. This decision also plays off of some emotional stuff Katara is going through too, but we'll get to that next season. Hey, look at Toph saying goodbye to Appa. Sokka is standing on Appa's horn here, right? And it seems like he just falls directly through it. Want to see the single weirdest split second mistake in the entire show? For some reason, Toph gets an airbender tattoo on her left hand here, and it disappears immediately, just like... What? All right, we've got some more dream interpretation here. From what I can tell in this one is that he's got a big fucking blue arrow on his head. This is a really strong moment for real though. You can feel that Zuko is somewhat relieved to still have his scar, but he's also disappointed. Anyone home? Wait, I'm starting to think this might be a trap. So this background here is where the gang just wrecked shop getting up to the palace just yesterday, and they cleaned it up pretty good. We are the Earth King's humble servants. Where's your nose? Awesome cliffhanger though. Really cool that it answers a really important question that we had from a prior episode and immediately poses more questions and a very, very scary threat. That's how you do a cliffhanger, folks. Awesome stuff. This episode's pretty good. It's really weird from a structure standpoint though. You get your big action scene right at the very start, which is pretty much the opposite of the Atla formula and most formulas, honestly. So they have that so the rest of the episode can be pretty much conflict resolution with the Earth King and getting him up to speed and then setting up the finale. And I think you really needed all that time code to get the the Earth King up to speed. Because if he just joined them immediately, it would make this giant struggle they just went through feel like it just paid off too easily. But then the rest of the episode is them finding out about their individual missions, which segues into the finale really well, and helps it not feel rushed. So having that big action scene right at the very start makes it feel like this entire episode wasn't all just politics and setup, and that's important for a show that has its blend of action, comedy, and drama so nailed like Avatar does. Aside from that, for the most part, it's just the hurdles we need to get through for the finale to work. It's a setup episode, and just because it's not as satisfying as the ones that get to pay off all of its hard work doesn't mean it's any less good. Patron shoutouts! If you want to be two episodes ahead of the YouTube releases, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts go to my top patrons, Fritz Sullivan, who was the first man to German suplex every top predator from each continent on Earth. Keegan Scott, who invented the guitar solo. He did it first. Mike the Wizard, who looks like an advanced alien race, tried to create the perfect human and succeeded. Skylos, who can do everything about 10% better than you can. And Zumpy, who sings single-handedly thwarted an alien invasion in 1977. Other huge shoutouts go to my other top patrons, Be My Valentine, Bingo Dingo, Code Canuck, Derek Cornwell, DJ Jax, Do Mutual Aid, Eleonora Rose, Glintlock, John Ajaka, Nicholas Abbott, Knock, Paker Gas, Rummy B, Steven Smart, The Most Super of Snippers, Tiago Nascimento, and Triad Juice. Next up is The Guru, one of my personal favorites. See you then.